So I, I wanted to basically, again, give a, a very basic introduction to um, analysis and reanalysis of products and systems. Um, the reason why I thought it would probably be a good idea to do this today is I wanted to quickly show you also the, the database structure um, at ECMWF of how to access these products. The reanalysis um, at ECMWF, uh, the present, should we say, most up-to-date version of the reanalysis is known as ERA interim uh, because it was supposed to be an interim uh, product between basically ERA 15 and then ERA 75, which in the end has been delayed quite a bit compared to the, the original timeline. So it turns out that ERA interim has, has been used for perhaps a longer period than was originally, originally envisaged. How many of you in the room have uh, heard of uh, ERA interim before or at least maybe even used it? Okay, how many of you have actually used it? A lot of people. How do you mostly access that? Uh, are you taking it directly from the ESMWF database, or are you using it from the data library? How, how many of you actually take an ERA interim from the ESMWF web server? Okay, so quite a few of you. So this might I might skip over this fairly quickly then in terms of the, the web access, because it seems a lot of you are familiar with the systems there. Okay, so I will just go over this quite quickly. Uh, it's a little bit of an introduction to reanalysis and analysis products. Um, essentially, it's one of the products we most often use for validation and evaluation of our NWP systems. Okay, so I mean, we we could use other data sources directly, and people do use those. So, for example, one might want to use. Uh, Synop stations, if you're interested in uh, surface variables, often for applications, of course, we're interested in near surface variables such as precipitation and temperature. Uh, the applications we will talk about next year, of course, would definitely be precipitation focused. Then data availability depends on where you are in the world and how open source uh, a lot of the data sources are. This is showing an example from a few years back now, uh, seven years ago, of Typically, the amount of data that was daily available daily, daily on the uh, global telecommunications uh, service so system. It's uh, the system whereby data in basically near real time is, is beamed around the world and collected in, in data collection centers. So, for example, in some areas which are quite data sparse, this doesn't actually represent the actual density of measurements. It's just the measurements that are available freely through the, uh, through the uh, GTS. And that's the same in Europe as well. The density, although it's higher, it doesn't reflect the actual data availability because not all station data are connected up and collected real time. So of course, uh, station data has advantages. You have a, quite a, a large array of, of uh, co-located information, especially if you're interested in clouds. You have for example, sites such as the ARM sites now and the uh, CleaverNet sites, which have a whole host of supplementary radar data co-located with the station. But they're not always and often available locally, especially if you want the whole suite of uh, processes measured, especially the radiation ones. And you have problems with handling data gaps, bad data, and the representativeness over complex terrain, of course. And then, of course, you can use satellites, satellite retrievals, so especially for variables such as precipitation, there's a whole wealth of satellite retrievals out there that provide precipitation, okay, which you might want to use for evaluation of your forecasts, a monitoring, a coverage depends on whether you're talking about a geostationary or polar orbiting satellite. And so these are combined to try and, uh, for example, make retrievals of especially surface properties of, of precipitation. Other variables, it's very difficult to get near surface information. So, for example, if you want to get temperatures, it's very difficult near the surface with microwaves because you don't know the emission properties of the surface. It depends on the texture, vegetation, soil moisture, and so on. So it depends on which variable. For many, many uh, properties, it's very difficult to get information close to the surface over land. Over oceans, of course, it can be easier. Especially for precipitation as well, it, it's, uh, it's really difficult to know what an 
to actually use what the advantages are. If you look at rainfall in Africa, you will find a whole array of uh, papers that discuss intercomparisons of various data sets, TRIM, CMORPH, they're, they're all in there. Now there's going to be GPN added to the mix. I mean, there's a whole world of them. Trying to know which one is best is extremely difficult. You'll find the papers they recommend TRIM in one area, CMORPH over high terrain uh, due to its use of uh, uh, microwave uh, channels for ice retrieval. So it's, it's really difficult to know what to use. So I've, I've just given some example, but this list is by no means exhaustive. And if you only need monthly means, then emerged products such as GPCP can be uh, actually very good, but it's not available near real time. If you want something that's near real time for monitoring purposes, then uh, there's uh, CMORPH and FUSE, for example, which is only available over Africa. TRIM no longer. It went down last year, which is another aspect you have to think about when you're using satellite retrievals directly is that the satellite has a certain lifetime and TRIM, for example, finished last year. Now there's going to be GPM, but it only recently came online. So it's uh, obviously a, a high quality instrument, but you don't have the, the history of measurements. You don't have the coherency. Okay. So on Wednesday, when we have the introduction to the data library, a lot of these kind of data sets, for example, trim and so on, are also available through the data library. So you'll see how you can retrieve some of these, how to manipulate them. It's a nice tool to be able to access these, manipulate them, take out, uh, should we say, areas cut out over certain locations and not have to go through the, the pain of going to each individual database directly and, and make your own conversions. And as I, I mentioned already, uh, a lot of variables uh, that you might want uh, are not actually that easy to get uh, for, from satellites, especially for near surface and especially over land. So even things as basic as surface temperature can be quite inaccurate. So station data are a good where they exist, uh, but they require careful treatment. You have your problems with uh, basically the, uh, the, the network density and so on. And then satellite-like data can be useful for a regional view, um, but uncertainties are large and not all parameters are available. So a supplementary source for basically uh, information about the climate states is analysis and reanalysis. Okay. So these systems were event, originally developed because of this initial value problem of numerical weather prediction. So analysis systems, uh, their, their sole purpose is to basically take information from a lot of different measurement sources, uh, station data, satellite data, radio sound, balloon soundings, and so on, and try and combine these into a picture of the atmosphere. Uh, and a picture of the atmosphere that's not only accurate, but is also representative of a, of a balanced state. So you don't want a picture of the atmosphere which basically has, for example, a lot of instability that as soon as you let your forecast system go, bang, you, you send off a whole load of explosive convection, you know, tropical cyclones going off everywhere. It needs to be a balanced state and a state that's uh, in equilibrium with your forecast modeling system. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to take a wide variety of variables from a wide variety of instruments with vastly different measurement densities, we need to take care to reject bad measurements, okay, and then combine them into an assessment of the atmospheric state. And as I said, it needs to be somehow a near balance with the forecast climate uh, and also in uh, large scale balance. So it, it doesn't sound very easy, in fact, does it? I mean, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's an engineering problem, but it, and it's an extremely difficult one. A lot of the advances in uh, forecast quality over the last two decades have actually been in improvements in understanding of how to achieve this sole task. So we tend to concentrate again on our advancement on how we represent the model, uh, the physics of how we represent the atmospheric processes, but this engineering task of putting together observational information and actually supplementing it with new satellites as they come along has actually been one of the, the fundamental sources of our advance in the, the forecast quality. So Frederick showed one of the charts of progressing forecast quality 
this morning in his talk. And so, so in data simulation, I've just got two slides on a rough background of how it works. Uh, don't worry if it's, uh, if I'm not going to go into the details of the, the, the equations or the background, just to give you a rough idea. And essentially what we need to do uh, for each measurement source and type, we need to basically define a, a radius of, should we say, influence of each of those data types, both in the horizontal and in the vertical. And that will depend on the, the, the data density, of course. So something like satellite data, you often need to thin out the data because you have very high density measurements. So you may throw a lot of that information away and just subsample. Something like a radio sonde, uh, which are launched very infrequently. You all know what a radio sonde is, yes? So it's uh, basically a, a balloon that uh, floats out with a little packet that sits underneath that has a, basically a GPS a connection and it measures temperature and it measures uh, humidity and you know where it is so you assume it's affected with the winds so it measures four quantities um, your UMV components and uh, of the wind and your humidity and your temperature and uh, they're quite clever little things actually they cost quite a bit of money I think the last cost I saw by Sila is about 800 euros and the thing doesn't come back so it's quite expensive that's why there's not many of them uh, around uh, You know what, every country, if you look at a map of Italy, I think we have two sites where they go up in Italy each day. One is at Udine, just up the road. I mean, they're expensive. It's the manpower as well. They have to be manually launched. So you need at least uh, two people to man one of these stations. It's not, it's not a cheap undertaking at all. And, uh, and they're quite clever. So even the humidity sensors, it's not just a single sensor. There's two of them. They pulse heat them between them. So one's heated while the other one measures, and they pulse back and forth so they don't suffer from freezing problems as they go through clouds uh, so that you, because there used to be a lot of problems with them icing up and measuring saturated conditions as you came out of clouds. So this whole technology of measuring the atmosphere is extremely complicated. It's not just the satellite side that's complicated. Uh, and this, just, just this simple task is, uh, is not that straightforward because you can imagine with this schematic, just one example, where if you have a strong inversion in temperature, as you're measuring, you might uh, simply say, well, my, my, my measurement has a certain influence in the vertical. Well, in the, in the well-mixed boundary layer, a measurement in one point is representative maybe of the virtual potential temperature throughout that whole layer. But as you get close to the inversion, then maybe the measurement here has nothing to do with what's going on above the inversion. So you can have, uh, I mean, it's the same in the horizontal as well, when you're going across fronts or so on, it's, uh, you, you might find a, a complete uh, cutoff between the, the two air masses. And so actually putting information in a measurement here and using it to tell you what's going on here might actually do more harm than good. And then essentially, this is uh, a simulation in a nutshell. Uh, again, don't worry if this is a, is a, a little bit too complicated. But it's just a graphical way of showing what's going on with these assimilation systems. So you'll have a, a window, okay, over which you want to basically determine, should we say, the state of the atmosphere. So this is typically 12 hours long, okay. And during that window, you will have, I'll use the mouse actually to point so you can see on both screens. So you will have a number of observations of a certain property. So, um, we have all sorts of observations. We have brightness temperatures being measured by satellite. Uh, there'll be direct temperature measurements, pressure, humidity. So all in different states. So you can imagine this, for example. This is actually a, a, a multi-dimensional state. You can just think of it as temperature for the moment. But the nice thing about the simulation system is it's bringing all this information in in terms of different types of variables. Okay. And then basically, the whole system is based around the forecast model. So you can imagine that we start at the beginning from some kind of first guess state of the atmosphere, and we run a, a, a forecast, basically forward in time, okay? And it's not going to be the same as the observations because we have uncertainty in the initial conditions, as we said this morning, and we have uncertainty in the model physics, okay? And then the whole goal is to basically find a minimal perturbation to the initial conditions such if we start from this perturbed initial conditions, we minimize the distance of the new forecast from the original one, but also to the observations. Okay. 
And by doing that, the nice thing is, is that this final forecast, because it's based around a forecast model, the 3D, or yeah, 4D, because it's evolving in time, picture of the atmosphere, will be balanced. And it's also using the model system. So it's also going to be in close balance to the, the climate of the model. So you don't want to just simply fit through all of these observations. Okay. Now, we also make a number of other assumptions. If, uh, when we take this first guess, if we have observations that are too far away from the first guess, then we, we, we kind of say, well, we kind of trust the first guess forecast to be in the ballpark, so this is a bad measurement. And we throw those away. We reject them automatically. Now, of course, you can see there might be some problems there. This could be a bad measurement, you know, maybe a temperature of minus 5,000 Kelvin. So it's obviously wrong. But on the other hand, it could well be because you may have a, like a, a tropical cyclone that's misplaced. So you have very severe winds here. And maybe your model in the first guess has it over here. So you have strong departures in both locations. And then you end up throwing away uh, observations. I, remember, I don't know if it's still the case now, but often they used to have these drop zones. You know, the, the, the Americans uh, uh, have some planes that are set up. As soon as they know there's a, basically a, a, a hurricane coming in, they'll send out their planes to try and send all these drop zones around to get highly detailed thermodynamic and dynamical measurements around the developing system. If you haven't got the system in the right place, your model goes, oh, that's a bad measurement, and just throws all this information out and it's not used. So you can see there's all sorts of problems there with this automatic screening. screening. The nice thing about this system, though, is by, because remember, this is not just temperature. This is a multivariate state. So you use, for example, uh, forward models to take the, the fields of like humidity and temperature. And if you have a satellite you try and simulate what the brightness temperature of the satellite would actually see to get the departure. So what this means is, what's the advantage of this? Is that it's not that your analysis of the temperature is only impacted by the atmospheric temperature measurements. So when we send up a radio sun ballooning, it measures temperature. So you don't think of it as a kind of simple interpolation technique that those temperature measurements then give me my temperature field in the analysis, and my wind measurements give me my wind field. All of the information is combined jointly to give this overall global view of the atmosphere. And so, in fact, if you actually look, I think I've got a, a slide later, but I might skip over it in the interest of times. But if you look, for example, at the African Easterly Jets, just as an example, the winds that are analyzed in the system are more impacted by the temperature measurements, which affect the gradients of temperatures and the pressure gradients, than they are the wind measurements. So sometimes that takes some people by surprise. If you're all very familiar with the system, maybe not. But you, you would think that if I take away, if I hide all the wind measurements from the system, I would mess up the wind field. But in fact, you make the wind field less accurate by taking out the temperature measurements in some locations than you do the wind because the temperature gradients have a much bigger impact on the balance of the atmosphere and the overall wind. So that's one of the strengths of this kind of system. It's not just a univariant retrieval of one variable of just temperature or winds from different observations. So you're not using one satellite to give you winds and another source of information to give you temperature. You're using all of these sources, combine them to give a balanced state. But your wind measurements will affect your temperature and your temperature will affect your wind and your end product is a balanced state. Of course, what you actually do with this minimization, because to do the minimization, you need a, a linear approximation of your model and an adjoint and invoice. So you actually, it's like a multi-stage iterative process. You do one minimization, then you use the minimized run as your new first guess, and you go through another minimization using the simple linear physics, to give you an idea. So the recipe is you make a short forecast, as I said, that's your control. You throw out this bad data, okay? Then you use this uh, minimization process using the linear and adjoint model to find this perturbation, okay? And then you use that as your new control, and you go through this process. So you have three loops of this minimization inside the Eastern WF system. Again, if that hasn't changed recently. Still three, yeah? <laughs> I'm always worried that they put something in two months ago I didn't know about, and then... Uh, 
I'm out of date. Okay. So you hope if you did this infinitely, you would eventually converge. That's not always the case. You can have situations where in the loops you jump around and you're not converging, but uh, hopefully it should be. When you finally converge, this final forecast through this 12-hour window, you can then take snapshots like a photograph in time and say, this is my analysis. This is my best guess of what the state of the information is, the atmosphere. Okay? So remember, this is our 12-hour window, so maybe we're starting from midnight and we're going through from, to midday. And then we say, okay, let's take a photograph here and here. Now, this is simplified, in fact, because the windows are actually slightly offset. Okay? This is just to make it, I've just simplified it a little bit. So you actually have a slight staggered, so it's not exactly at the end of the window here. But you can say you just take basically a snapshot at 6 and 12, and that's your analysis. And then you can start the, the whole process again for the next 12-hour window. It's all done in near real time. It has to be fast and efficient, because you need that forecast out in a few hours to be useful. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm showing all this is there's a little bit of confusion sometimes about fluxes. So you take this snapshot, and this will be your temperature or your humidity field. Okay. But what about rainfall? Okay. Or what about radiation? Now, it wouldn't be much point, there wouldn't be much point to look at six o'clock, look at the rain flux, and then just look at the rain flux at 12 and say, okay, that's my rainfall. Why not? Because rain, of course, is highly variable. So it can be raining like mad here. One hour before, maybe it wasn't raining at all, or one hour afterwards. So the rain can be highly variable in time. So what do we do with that? Well, to actually get the fluxes, so it's such radiation that which you want to be conserved, we want to accumulate them over time. So what ECMWF does is that from inside the system, as well as running this assimilation window, they run forecasts, short forecasts, from 0, 0, and 12, forward in time. And they are used to give you the fluxes. Okay. So really, I should have put this arrow here, actually, to be precise, because it doesn't start from 6, it starts from 0 and 12. So you would start from this picture here, and you run forward in time. Okay. So what it means is, when you're using an analysis product, if you use temperature, it's the direct analysis of what you think the atmospheric state is. But when you use analysis rainfall, it's not the analysis. It's basically you're just using a, a short prediction, a rainfall forecast. Okay. So there is basically a, a difference between those two. And of course, you have a choice then of how you actually retrieve that rainfall. Okay. So for example, what you could do if you imagine you've got a, so this is 0, 0, 12, and 24. You could have a forecast starting at 0, 0 and running forwards 24 hours. So you simply take the rainfall accumulated over that 24 hours for that single forecast. Okay? But you could also take a forecast starting from 0, 0 to 12. And then the forecast starting from 12 until 24, and then add those two together. You see what I mean? They both give you a, a flux of rainfall over the 24 hours, except this is from two 12-hour forecasts, and this is from one 24-hour forecast. Now, with ERA 40, for example, how many of you have heard of ERA 40, the previous generation? Quite a few of you. So what did people do? Somebody used ERA 40. What did people do for rainfall for ERA 40 and why? An ERA 40 user. Anybody? Any clues? Do you think they used too short 12 hours or did they use a 24 hour? Option A or option B? Okay, trick question. My diploma students know I'm always asking nasty questions like that. Is it A or B? No, actually it's C. No, they didn't do either of those two. What they tended to do is take a forecast here from 12 o'clock the day before, throw away the first 12 hours, and then take the difference between the range of 12 and 36. 
Now that seems a bit bizarre, doesn't it? Because, okay, here is your first 12 hours. So you have a lead time of 12 hours. This option here, well, this is a bit simpler because we don't have to bother adding the two fields together, but it's a lead time which are average of 12 hours lead time instead of an average of six hours lead time because it's going from zero to 24. Now we're actually throwing away short range information and taking from 12 to 36. Why would you want to do that? Spin up, exactly. It's the spin up. Because in the era 40, it's an older generation of analysis system from 15 years ago. And there was a problem, particularly in the tropics, after the SSMI satellite went in, inside the system, it wasn't quite in balance. And so what tended to happen after about 1987 is that the satellite would make the analysis, the state of the atmosphere, more moist than the model wanted it to be in terms of its climate. So what happened in the first 12 hours, it would just rain it all out. You would have a spin-up before it settled down. So you used to throw away this. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is when I asked who used ERA, a lot of hands went up in the room. Okay. And you'll see a lot of scientific articles where they say, we use ERA interim temperature and rainfall analysis. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is when you're reading a paper like that, I want you to see how many of those papers tell you how they retrieve the rainfall. You count how many of those papers tell you how they retrieve the fluxes. Now, it seems like I'm being pedantic, but it's actually really important because where is your reproduci reproducibility? If you want to take that information and repeat that, you don't know how the analysis was actually conducted. So I, it's, a, it's a little bit of a bugbear of mine, which is why I'm, I'm on my soapbox now uh, about it. But if you write a paper and you're using your interim, I think it's really important to state how you achieved your fluxes and put it in the paper. We used... The 12 hours and the 12 hours, and we added them together. Or we perhaps took the whole 10-day forecast, and we did it every 10 days. But you need to put it into your papers how it's used. You look how many papers actually state that. I think it's less than 1 in 10. So you don't know how they use the data. People tend to like, uh, describe era interim rainfall as if it were just like fuse rainfall or trim rainfall. But it's not the case. OK. So. Um, in which, which respect do you mean reference uh, of how to use this? Well, the, the main thing is understanding the background of how these fluxes are put together. Uh, and so the main thing is if you are writing a paper, you to put it into your paper as a reference of how you're using the data. That's, that's the point I wanted to emphasize. Exactly. Yes. So I'm going to come to that at the end. What I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly show. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I want to leave a lot of time to actually go for the S2S database. Uh, Frederick, after the break, will be showing the S2S database. Uh, what I have done is I've put a little exercise sheet. For those of you less familiar, because a lot of you I thought might be familiar, I've got a little exercise sheet that you can have a look at just to play with some of the data. I just want to show the, in the interface. The other thing is, if you're using the web interface, you can't do this, 0 to 24, because you can only go up to step 12 on the web interface. If you use the web API Python method to remotely access, then you have the option of the two, because you have more flexibility in specifying your, your run times. So anybody using the web access can only take this and this and add it together. Okay. So as I said, uh, well, I'll skip over that because I've said already. So what does the system actually take into account? Well, we've seen this already. Uh, pressure information. There is actually very little you can use from uh, SYNOP stations. It's very difficult because of the non-representativeness of the station data, the complex topography. It's actually quite difficult to use other variables from the, the station other than, uh, than pressure. I think some humidity information was used... Um, so during the day, but not at night. Is that correct? Was it used all day round now? I can't remember. I think the, it's all right down now. It used to be just during the day when, when, with the old system. Uh, the radio sond, so that's a, a Vesila, um RS-92 sond um, in Ghana. 
and you can see how few of those there are. So it's not just Africa where they're sparse, it's everywhere. Okay, they cost a lot of money. Um, some aircraft data is simulated, but again, of course, you're reduced to actually using information where the flight tracks are. Um, and satellite data. Okay, I need to update this. This really steep increase. It does flatten off a little bit in the more recent years, but it's still increasing the amount of satellite information that's ingested in this system. And this has been a real revolution just in the last decade. So satellites have been around for a long time, but in terms of the amount of information that we use now in initializing NWP, it's, it's really taken off in the last decade. And that's because we didn't have the analysis systems before to be able to actually use this information in a sensible way. So it was used imagery for monitoring and so on. And so that's really been a, a revolution, should we say. So I think you showed a very similar plot to this this morning, Frederick. And this just shows the top line. Uh, these are different uh, forecast lead times. So this is like day 10, day 7, day 5. Top line shows northern hemisphere. The bottom line shows the southern hemisphere. The key thing I wanted to show here is how they diverge once that satellite information starts to get used globally. Okay? So you find that the quality of the forecasts starts to basically match in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. Okay. Beware of interpreting this to mean that we can do away with conventional measurement sources okay, and only use satellite. That's not the message to take home here. Why? Because when we launch a satellite, okay, you know, these things being launched into space is, is, is not exactly a, a smooth uh, process. It's like, you know, these, you're going through massive temperature, contrast, the thing's being rattled around. So once it's launched, this satellite, doesn't matter how carefully you're trying to calibrate it in the lab, it'll be all over the place, the settings. So how do they calibrate it? They calibrate it against the forecast systems. So the satellite's not giving you an absolute measurement. It's just giving you anomalies. Okay. The only thing that ties this analysis down to a truth at the end of the day are the radio sons. Okay. So although this says, yes, the information from satellite has improved the southern hemisphere and brought it up to the northern hemisphere, okay. but if you got rid of the radio sons, the whole thing would go haywire. You've got no way of calibrating your system. It's the radio sons that tie you down to an absolute value, okay, that calibrates the, calibrates the satellites, which then give you the supplementary information in the areas where you don't have the conventional information. Okay. So the thing I wanted to get across here is when you're using analysis, you know, sometimes it's used a lot, okay, and then sometimes people say, yes, but you can't trust this from analysis, it's only a model. Now, that, that's to a certain extent true, it really depends on what you're looking at. So if you want to look at something that's very dynamical, uh, the winds, okay, then you'll find that they can actually be very high quality if you compare them. The further down the thermodynamic chain you go towards clouds and precipitation, the more model dependent that product becomes. Okay. So you'll find that if you're looking at an analysis uh, of rainfall, then yes, there is quite a lot of model in there. In fact, for the analysis system for the malaria, we tend to use temperature T2M from era interim, but we use some of the retrieval products for precipitation. Okay. So there is, it's almost like a league, like the Premier League, and then you've got the championship, and then you've got the lower divisions of parameters in terms of your, should we say, um, uh, level of confidence in those parameters. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I had a couple of extra slides just about some examples in Africa with data denials. Okay. But what is reanalysis? Okay. Now, as we already said this morning, operational systems used for both medium range, but also S2S, uh, like the system at ESMWF, they're updated all the time to take advantage of updates to satellite systems, updates to the model physics, uh, updates to the infrastructure of the data assimilation system, okay? So what this means is the analyses are not coherent in time, okay? Because the model system that's underlying is actually changing, okay? 
So if you look at a temperature trend, it could just simply be due to the model physics changing over time and not necessarily due to a real temperature change. Okay. So one way to actually improve this is to actually run reanalyses. So you're taking one analysis system and you're using it to go back in time and look at the data sources and then rerun over time. Okay. So the advantage is you have a, a single coherent system. Okay. So it's one assimilation system. What would be another advantage to do this, a reanalysis? So one thing is that if I want to look at the analysis from 2000, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm basically using a much older modeling system, much older analysis system than I have now. But what else, what other advantage would I have of rerunning a reanalysis? That's right, so you have a new model system. That's right, so you, you may be, if we started a new real analysis now, of course, we'd want to take the latest state-of-the-art version of the Eastern WF model from 2015, and we'd go back maybe to 1960 and, and rerun it through time. And so, you know, we would hope that the new state-of-the-art system now would have a better analysis for the year 2000 than the era interim system would have, because the era interim system was state-of-the-art in 2006, one decade ago. Okay. What would be another advantage to running a reanalysis? Well, as you have said now, that um, we are using today's um, uh, processing power that we have because we have higher resolution. Details of uh, some parameters would be, would, would be more explicit than Right, okay, so we would have uh, a newer model system with newer model physics, a better data simulation system. We could probably afford to rerun it with a higher resolution, smaller box sizes, so the system would be improved. Any other idea? Physics is good, so the whole system, all the aspects, the resolution will be better, the model will be better. Coherent. There's one other thing, actually, interesting. I was wondering if anyone would get it. When I tell you, you'll go, oh, of course, it's obvious. Remember, the analysis system, when I was talking about it, is real time. You're up against a barrier, okay, of time. That information comes in. You need to have an efficient system. You want the forecast out within a few hours, okay? It's no point me giving you a forecast for this week, but giving it to you next Monday, it's too late then. No, you need it now. So, if I launch a radio sound, okay, in Udina today, but then I go for coffee, I do some other things first, and then at 6 o'clock I think, oh, I better send that data. And now it's fairly automated in most places, but sometimes it's sent manually. Or there's some problem with the infrastructure of the network. Say that is late in arriving, that piece of information. If it misses the window, it doesn't go in the analysis, because that analysis system is real time. So you hope to get the data in, but a lot of information comes in afterwards. There may also be research campaigns. AMA is a good example in West Africa, a massive research campaign. So that data is not taken and delivered real time, but you might have high quality instruments that were used in a research campaign that the researchers then process, clean up, remove some of the obvious bad data, process it, and make it available in a format that can be used in these assimilation systems. So when you do a reanalysis, your big advantage is you also have a lot more in the way of information. Okay, because a lot of data that was late, a lot of research data, and other data platforms can be incorporated that weren't available at the time. Okay. So sometimes people miss that aspect of the two systems. So, however, what's the disadvantage? It's expensive. So you'll find that compared to the current state-of-the-art system, the reanalysis system will tend to be much lower resolution. Okay? Plus, once you start it, you can't keep running a new reanalysis every week or every month. So... Uh, essentially, like I said, era interim started in 2006. It was state-of-the-art then, but in the meantime, there's been another decade of model and assimilation developments at ESMWF, okay, 
which haven't been incorporated into it. So the analysis is always using the latest operational system. It's your highest resolution. It's using the latest observational suites. The model and the observations, though, they change over time. Okay? And another aspect is it's not always easily available because your analysis system, okay, these are quite sensitive. It's not very easy for somebody from the outside world to get access to the operational system analysis from ESMWF. They allow the ERA interim to be used as a resource. But the operational analysis, you can't just go onto this site and say, take today's analysis as a GRIB or a NetCDF file. Okay. If you do have access, the operational analysis is ideal if you want to look at a recent case study. So if I wanted to look at a, a high-impact event for 2013, okay, I would use the analysis and not the reanalysis if I had access to it because it's a newer system and it's much higher resolution, okay? If, however, you want to look at diagnosing, for, diagnosing the, I don't know, the NAO or changes in, uh, I don't know, ENSO variability over a long period of time, you want to look at interannual variability or, or you want to evaluate your hindcar suite from S2S going back over 18 years, and you certainly don't want to be using the analysis because 18 years ago, the system was very basic. 18 years ago, let me just do my date calculation. I don't think it was even using 4D VAR. I think it was still 3D VAR at that point. So it's a completely different assimilation structure. Okay. So then you want to be using reanalysis. So it's not your best of your best, but it's you have more continuity. Okay. But you have to remember for recent dates, I say obsolete, no offense intended, but it is a 10-year-old system almost now, from 2006. Okay. So it's ideal for longer-term investigations. The reason why I put this up, again, is a lot of people have used reanalysis, but I sometimes find that people show like case studies and they're using reanalysis when it would really, they would perhaps be better off using the operational analysis if they can get hold of it, uh, you know, maybe for a collaboration or... Uh, if they have a member state account or something. I'm not quite sure what the access rights are, for example, for ECWF or, or another national center's analysis system. Okay. So I've tried to sum this up in this kind of uh, schematic here where reanalysis, you have no improvements in model, but it's continuous in time. So for era interim, for example, the model and assimilation system is fixed. So that was actually used in 2006. Okay. You have all the new data in terms of satellites coming online, so you have an improvement in the observational system roughly up to 2006, and then to a certain extent, that's not true after 2006, because a lot of the new satellite systems, the era interim doesn't really know how to incorporate that information, because it hasn't had the updates that allow new satellite products. The operational system keeps improving in time, but of course you don't have that continuity but you are able to take advantage. So you get this increasing gap in quality as you go past 2006, but you've got this huge detriment, of course, if you go right back to 1980s at the beginning. Okay. So it's just to kind of emphasize those, those, uh, those differences. Okay. Um, there was something else I wanted to say about that. I don't remember. And just to give you an idea of how often these things uh, are updated, that's what I was going to say. So your interim was from 2006. The previous generation was using a model that was operational in 2000. Okay. And then era 15. Do you remember what cycle era 15 was from? From roughly what year? No, I don't remember. I have to look that up. Yeah, that was a long while ago, actually. I need to check that out. So my take-home messages are analysis products are a useful supplement to observations, but you have to be careful for which variable. Okay? Instantaneous fields are from the model analysis, but fluxes are from short-range forecasts, and you have to be careful about how you combine them. Okay? And for recent case studies, you might often be better off actually looking at the operational system rather than the reanalysis product. Okay. So it's 10 to 3. Three. Um, what I wanted to do, I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this because some of you are already using the product. So I did want to just show a very quick demonstration 
of the of the server. Okay, just to give you an idea. Okay, without going for a web API. Uh, and then I have a little exercise sheet online. After the break, when we come back from coffee, we're mostly going to focus, Frederick's going to go through and introduce the web interface for the S2S, okay? Um, and what I'm going to do is, if you have any of you in, questions about ERA Interim, uh, in the lab, you can take me to one side, we can do things on the side, I can show you a few bits and pieces, and uh, also an example for the web API, okay? Does anybody have any questions before I just show the... Um, Right. <clears throat> yeah, so it seems to be a question. I mean, even Paolo, when we were talking yesterday, you were asking me a question about the rainfall as well. No, because I, I find that the, the fluxes is a thing that confuses people the, the most, actually. You, you were going to say something. Is there a new separate wiki that's been set up for that? Or? Yeah. The thing, the thing is that when you get the actually won't give you Right. Yes. They won't let you do the 24 hour either, will they? Yeah. No, because I haven't tried that directly because I normally log on locally and then take it. Yeah. So I have that option. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's the one problem sometimes is I'm not completely familiar with the access rights f from somebody outside who's not a member state or a local person. So. I apologize in advance if sometimes I tell you something and it turns out you don't have permission to do it, okay? <laughs> so, um, so that seems to be the case for the 24-hour the rainfall. Because like when you, when you answer the email, you say, well, you normally use the 24-hour. And I said, well, on the web, you don't have that. Okay. So let's just spend a little bit of time. I know it's hot in here and some of you are probably snoozy. It's the first day, but we won't spend too long in it. Don't worry. So the first thing I wanted to say was that... Um, the web page of the program, that stays here after the workshop, okay? And so those lecturers who are happy to have their material distributed, it will be appearing on here under links, each of the talks, okay? But what I'm going to do to kind of keep things in near real time, in case if some of you want to browse the, the talks, is I'm actually collecting uh, on this Dodds server uh, different material. So Paula, for some of the lab classes, is putting information there. So I've written the, the address up there because it's a little bit small to see. Let's see if I can blow it up here as well. But No, it's only changing the font and not the address. So it's klima-dodds, okay, HTTP, and then it's just ICTP.it, and then it's users, which I think is a capital U, yes, and then it's SMR2714, which is the number of this workshop. So... Treat that as a, a temporary resource because once everything goes onto the web page of the workshop, then this will eventually disappear, okay? But it's to enable us very simply to do things in near real time during the course of the workshop, okay? And so I've already popped my lectures there in this week one, okay? Perhaps somebody over coffee can just check to make sure I've got the permissions right for an external user. <laughs> if I click in on one of those and see if it's visible to you. So there'll be some things here as well, like uh, data library in Python. That, um, and so there in week one, there's also a, a very simple little handout, okay? Like I said, I don't want to spend too much time on this because a lot of you are familiar with the analysis, but it's just got a very simple little, basically a little synopsis of the lecture I just gave, just a little description, okay? Uh, a couple of examples of um, what we're going to go through now. Okay. Also an example of, um, the, then later on there's also an example of a web API retrieval. Links to the wiki, because I have to say now actually documentation is improving at the ECMWF. So for the S2S, for example, Frederick will demonstrate the wiki pages. Uh, so that's much more flexible. That was actually a big shortcoming of the ECMWF pages in the past, that they were very static. And it was very difficult for people, even if they wanted to, to put information onto the web. Okay. I've also, and again, I wasn't quite sure how much this was going to be needed, um, 
grip a NetCDF. How many of you are familiar with using NetCDF information? So that's all of you, pretty much. Okay, what about grip? Less. Okay, good. Because we're mostly going to be using uh, NetCDF. So again, for those, if any of you have not seen NetCDF, take a quick read through that uh, synopsis. It's just a couple of paragraphs. And we're going to do a little bit on the fly that you can pull me to one side in the lab and I can sit with some of you to try and get you up to speed also after hours or whatever on the NetCDF side of things. Because I, I don't want to go through a lesson on what NetCDF is and real basic stuff uh, for those of you that are already familiar with it. But on the other hand, I don't want people to be left behind if one of two of you are not familiar. Okay? So have a look at this worksheet if you're not familiar with NetCDF. And it's got a description of a few tools such as um, as a little bash overview of a couple of basic commands just to get you going. Uh, NetCView and NCDump. NCView and NCDump. Hands. NCView. Okay, less. NCDump. Same people, of course. <laughs> I'm going to throw these in. Okay, so they're very useful tools for quick looks. CDO, Climate Data Operators. Users. Okay, about half of you. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to play this by ear then. We may uh, put an hour in, in a kind of split class on CDO. Okay. This is quite difficult to ascertain from the applications. Okay. And a few little exercises. And I've even put a little tiny bit in there. I just um, on doing some simple plots in R as well. So NC view gives you a quick look. Now the other problem this week is we had huge conversations about which packages to use for processing. And uh, we said, oh, well, should we use Octave? Or well, there's R, we can use Grads. But then Grads doesn't do everything well. But then things that do everything well can be quite complicated. And even these don't do everything. Then you've got NCL, it's got built-in things, but it can be very clunky. So that was really difficult to decide. And so, I mean, I'm always of the viewpoint that there's no perfect package. And some of you will already be familiar with a certain package and not want to change. So we're going to try and be a little bit flexible on that without going down the path of one package, okay? But if there are requests, again, we can see what we can do, maybe even in the second week, to perhaps run a little lab optional for R, for example, or for the MGO, for example, there's a really nice built-in package for MGO statistics and NCL, so beautiful ready-made examples. It seems pointless to try and code those up in Octave uh, although we've got some Octave scripts for MGO as well that Paolo's done. So that was the real big difficult question. Um, so have a, have a little look at that. It won't all be useful. Some of it will be boring. It's just got a little tiny snippet for all of those. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to just quickly show this. It's 5 2. Coffee's going to be ready at 3. I'm going to just show like for 5 10 minutes, just very quickly, okay? Just to demonstrate so that when we come back, we can move on to the S2S. So I have logged in here, and you can see I've logged in because my name's up here in the top right corner. Let me just zoom in a little bit. Is that reasonably clear? Can you see that at the back, the, the writing? Let me see if I can get it a bit bigger. So one of the things that you will be required to do for S2S is set up an account. Do it. How many of you already have an account at ESMWF to access... Okay, good, about a third of you. So those of you that don't, your homework for tonight is, Frederick will show you how to actually log on and get an account. It's free, you just have to type in your email address and name, and you get a kind of you know, password sent back you just to, to accept the terms and conditions. It's just so they know who's using the data and that you agree not to then put it onto your blog site and pass it out to the rest of the world, okay? Um, so your homework is, you can't come to the reception until you've done it. Okay, no, joking. But, um, but tonight, sometime, use one of the desktops or your laptop to log on and get a, a password as per Frederick. Please do it. It's really important. Make sure it's running because tomorrow, when we're in the lab, we want to hit the ground running, okay? So we don't want to be in there trying to sort out, oh, well, I haven't got a password, I can't log in, okay? So please do that tonight if you haven't already got it. Once you've done that, this will become quite familiar. The reason why I wanted to show this first is this is uh, similar to the S2S and the TIGI databases, but it's a little bit simpler, okay? So what you'll find on the left is you'll have a, a list of, like a menu of 
different kinds of aspects of the analysis. So we have surface, model levels, pressure levels. So where the information is available, I'll just focus on the surface for the moment. Okay. We're going to look at daily, which we already have. So we have era interim daily. Okay. And then the interface is actually fairly simple. We only have uh, a few choices uh, that we need to select. So the first area at the top is just simply the dates we want to retrieve. So you can either have a from to range of dates, or you can select uh, basically months of data at a time. Okay, And you can also, in a shorthand way, select a whole year, or if you want just all marches, you can click on all the marches, which is quite neat. So if you want to do like uh, DJF, you don't have to retrieve the whole year's data. You can just click your DJF and get it for all of the years. Era interim starts from 1979, so it pretty much covers the whole of the, the satellite period. Okay, If you want to go further back in time, there is actually now recently released, uh, I haven't talked about it here, but there's uh, Era 20C. C is the one that uh, brings in the assimilation, though. No? And then CM is just the model only, or have I got it around the wrong way? Okay, okay, and C, and then just C on its own is just the analysis one, yeah? Just to make sure I don't get that mixed up. So there is actually a much longer 20th century uh, analysis, but it has very limited observations. So it doesn't even use the satellite. The idea is to really make sure it's consistent in time, but it's a lot of model and very little observations, okay? But if you're interested in that, and you want to go right back to the beginning of the 20th century, I can talk about that offline. I just wanted to flag it. But for most of our purposes, of course, with S2S, where the hindcasts just go back on the order of two decades, then era interim is perfect for our needs. Okay? So in my 10 minutes, the only thing I did want to actually demonstrate is this thing that causes a little bit of confusion here. Okay? And that's these, basically, what we've got is two lots of time variables. We've got time, which says 0, 6, 12, and 18. Okay? And then we have step, okay. So if you put time and step together, of course, you get another word. <laughs> it's like a time step, yeah. So, um, so what's time and what is step? So time is your analysis time. When I was talking about that snapshot, okay, that's what that's referring to. So remember, you had those two slots in each analysis 12-hour window. So two of these will be from one window and two from a subsequent window, okay? So that's your analysis time. Step is then refer referring to your forecast step. You know, so you're both, they're both moving forward in time, but like one of them, this is your static analysis time. And then from each of these 12 and 0 times, you're launching a forecast forward in time. Okay? So what we're essentially seeing is, if you can imagine, the time for each day, we've got 0, 6, 12 and 18, okay? And then remember, we're launching from two of the points forward, forecast, okay? Which is going 12 hours forward in time. It actually goes more than. So again? So each 12 hour window is a cycle, okay? So the analysis times are taken, you're basically sampling two points in a window to give you the analysis time, okay? And then you'll have a forecast that goes forward. It actually goes. Longer. So like I said, if you're interactively log on, you can go all the way out to 10 days. But on this system, we only have steps up to step 12. Okay. So if I want to know what the 12 o'clock temperature is over Trieste, okay, what would I set for time? 12. Does everybody agree? Yes. Yeah. And what would you set for step? step zero. zero. Very good. So that gives you the analysis at twelve o'clock. Yeah. Okay. How else could I get the twelve o'clock temperature over Trieste? Yes. So what would I select for that? Uh, you could take uh, every three hour time step. Or you take six 
But which time step would I take if I take the zero forecast? 12 hour, exactly. That's the only other way with this combination to get the 12 o'clock because my forecasts only go out to 12. So I can have the 12 hour forecast that started at zero. And that gives me the 12 o'clock temperature, but it's a forecast. Or I can take time equals zero, uh, 12, sorry, and step zero, and that gives me the analysis. Okay, so I have actually two options for the temperature. Okay. What about if I want precipitation over the whole day? Let's say I want 1st of January. So I'm going to take, I've got 1st of January 1979, and I'm going to put 1917, whoops, 1979. Okay, 1979-01-01. Okay, so I'm only picking one day. And I want the rainfall for that day. <laughs> so, so with this particular interface, I've only got one way of doing it. How do I get it? Depends. No, it doesn't depend. No, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> because our 24-hour accumulation is either you want to take 06 of that day to 06 of the next day. But why 06? I want the, the whole day, so starting from 00z. 0 to 24 hour precipitation. Don't measure like that. If you want some, something consistent, you start with your body to the next day. Right. Really? They do that from six, do they? Everywhere. Is that said, though? I've never, ever seen a forecast model of value. Yeah, you can use that. You do. You can do that, yeah. You can take this, zero, 06, but then you can't get the forecast. You can't do that on this system because you only have forecast from here. Okay, you're right. There's no way of doing that. For Z, but they do that for Z times, do they? That's something new I've learned, you see. I've never heard of that. Really, you take... Say again? Weather right. Yes. I think it depends on your time zone, no? Because it's to match with Z times. So I think in the UK, they take from 0 to 24, no? No. It's just WMO standard. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's 06 of Z as long it is 0 to 23 of November. Right. So you have to take measurements. Right. For 0601 of the day. Then you take the that's amazing. I never, did you know that? I didn't know that. That is my problem. Okay. Because that's interesting, because when you look at uh, satellite retrievals, of course, that's not what's done. They're normally, you're taking a window that's going from 0 to 24. And it sounds like uh, that's not what they do in, uh, in South America, actually. No, sorry, I didn't know that. It's good. Something I've learned today. Okay. So if you wanted to do an exact same retrieval with this interface, you can't do that. You would have to be uh, logged on local. I will try with the, the web API. Because the only way to get the 0 to 24 is basically to take 0 and 12 with the 12-hour 12 range. OK. Now, what you'll notice, actually, sometimes, if you click on some of these, you'll find that did you notice how some of these options change? So if I click on step 12, for example, have you seen how 6 and 18 analysis times are no longer available? And that's because, of course, we have no forecast from those times. OK. You'll also notice that if you click on a flux. So if I go to total precipitation, OK, and I click on that, then to try and help us not make mistakes, I can't click on step zero anymore, which will be an analysis. I can only cl click on three to 12, which is a forecast time. OK. So maybe one piece of feedback we could actually hand over. It would be quite nice if this system could be extended out to step 24, I think, for the analysis forecast, because it exists. And that would enable people also to really be able to subsample that. OK. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> Question? Very good question. Thanks. I wanted to mention that, and I hadn't uh, mentioned it straight away. Now, 
when you look at uh, any flux in the Eastern WF system, and this is pretty standard, the units are SI, okay? So rainfall is in meters, and it's from the start of the forecast, okay? So what I've got here, if I click on 12, and I click on 0 and 12, okay, I get two forecasts retrieved. One is the forecast starting from 0, 0, and it's the 12-hour forecast. And the next is a new forecast starting at 12 that goes from 12 to 24. Okay. So I have two values. What do I need to do? Average them or add them? Add them. Very good. Because uh, they're both starting, they're both from reset. If, on the other hand, you had a 10-day forecast and you want to know the rainfall at day 9, you would have to simply take the value at day 10, subtract day 9, and get that difference. Okay. <coughs> and it's actually an important point because one of the things that happen when you get very long, when they wanted, for example, to take, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of EC Earth. EC Earth? How many of you have heard of EC Earth? So there's a few of you. So EC Earth is a climate model that actually was taken using the IFS forecast model that's used in the S2S contribution, the seasonal forecast, and changing it for longer terms. One of the things they had to do there, actually, was actually... Uh, remove that accumulation because, of course, if you have many years, the problem with accumulating fields is you can lose accuracy when you get very, very large numbers. Okay, and you can't, you can't difference day whatever 100,000 and uh, day 100,001 because the difference is down in the small digits and you lose the accuracy of the rainfall field. So that that approach, unfortunately, can't be used for really long runs. So when you get to that front decadal forecasting and onwards. So that's, that's the main thing I wanted to, to point out here. I don't want to take too much time up going through the details here. At the bottom, if you're using the interactive system, you can see the Mars request. Uh, and when we look at the S2S, Frederick will show you that you can also now have an option with S2S that allows you to see the web API Python script that you can run locally on a desktop and access the database, which is, is really quite nice because you can use the web interface to familiarize yourself with how the database is structured. But then once you get used to that, you can click on that and get a kind of starting script that you can then modify interactively to do more advanced retrievals using the web API, which is much more powerful. Okay, So it's the same thing here, but with the Mars, which you use internally. So you click on this, and you see what the options are. So. I'm not going to go into details now. Frederick will be showing that with the S2S and the, the Python web API. Okay. How many of you actually are Python users, just out of interest? Okay, much less. Yeah, I've only written one or two programs myself. Okay, don't panic because you won't need to know that much. It's very uh, straightforward. Okay, we'll, we'll see a little bit of Python uh, as well. And you can do most of what we want to do. We can also use the, the web interface, okay? So you'll be able to use that. And then, of course, you can have options to retrieve GRIB or retrieve NetCDF. So let's just uh, go back and do this. And give an example, and then we'll go to copy. It's telling us atmospheric model, total precipitation, daily, step 12, 0 and 1. And I've somehow got all of the dates there. But let's just see what happens. <laughs> and it's telling me that it's going to the archive, and it's transferring this many bytes. And era interim, I think, these days is actually all on the cache. I think it's cached permanently. So Frederick will t tell you more details about that, but uh, most of the data at ESMWF is stored on a tape archive system. So he will actually be talking to you about how to access that tape archive quite efficiently. Because when you make retrievals to the S2S database, you don't want to have a loop that says, go to the tape, take one field. And then the next loop says, go to the same tape, take a field, and then go. Because otherwise, it's extremely inefficient, and it log jams the system, and the operators at Eastern WF get upset with you, and <laughs> it's not a good idea. You want to go to the tape once and take everything together if you can, okay? <coughs> you don't have to worry about that quite so much with ERA interim, because it's used so often that they actually put that onto a disk cache. 
So it doesn't use the tape system anymore, which means, first of all, it's much faster. And it also means you have less concern about repeated uh, retrieval requests because they're just going to the cache, the disk cache. Okay. So it's just happily retrieving, and we'll see the end product at the end. We can even have a quick look with NC View. So I, I suggest now that we break for coffee. Um, it's quarter past three. So if we come back at, I'd say, quarter to four, and Frederick is going to show you a, a demonstration of the S2S database. Okay. And then tomorrow, of course, we go into the info lab. The info lab is the <coughs> big room just across uh, the hall, directly across here on the far side. There are two computer labs. It's the bigger one of the two. And hopefully you'll remember which group you are in <laughs> for tomorrow morning. I think splitting it also for the first one is quite nice because it's easier to handle if you have questions. It's to keep everybody together. And it also means you're not queuing for the bank uh, for quite so long. OK. Um, any other questions? Hopefully that was fairly clear. So this at least gives you access to one simple product that you might want to use for uh, uh, precipitation and temperature for some of your validation when you're looking at case studies in your projects next week. And as I said, Paolo will be showing the, 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 um, the uh, IRI data library if you want to supplement that with some of the retrieval products for uh, precipitation and so on. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll nip up out for coffee. <laughs>